Good afternoon, Assembly 2020 online. I'm quite amazed that we got this setup working and hope it works throughout. Um, my name is Mikko Heinonen. I'm one of the founding team members of the Finnish Museum of Games, the executive editor of Scrolling Magazine, and also a member of Pelikone Pay on it, alongside a number of other things. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about Japanese home computers. And I, my, my subtitle is that it's a rabbit hole par excellence. Uh, a lot of people, they get into collecting for reasons of nostalgia. There's nothing wrong with that. But I've always been fascinated by rabbit holes, things where you start discovering other things and it goes deeper and deeper. And I'm pretty far into the rabbit hole of Japanese home computers, not quite at the bottom yet. So my information may be lacking, but it's so fascinating that I want to share it with you today. Here I have some examples of computers that were available in Japan and some that were only available in Japan. So if we uh, first start with the, the globally released ones, there was the MSX standard from a number of manufacturers, Sony, Panasonic, Canon, Toshiba, Yash Yashica, etc. We had the MSX2 from Sony, uh, Philips, Panasonic, etc., uh, to a limited extent. Then there was the Sharp MZ series, the MZ700 and 800. And then some fairly obscure ones like the Sword M5, for example. And this list is far from exhaustive. There are much more, but these are just some of the ones that someone might, might recognize. But when, then when we look at the, the machines that were only available in Japan, the, the list is much longer. So we have the MSX2 Plus standard, manufactured by Panasonic, for example. Then we have the Turbo R, also by Panasonic. I'm not going to talk about the MSX today, sorry guys, because it's a, a widely appreciated computer that has a major scene. I'm not that much uh, into it, I'm not that familiar with it because it, it has a good, very good group of users that keep, keep its banner high. Uh, then from NEC, we had the uh, PC6000, the PC6001, 8001, and then we had the 8800 8, and the 9800, 9, or the PC88 and PC98, as they are commonly referred to. Uh, those I will talk about today. Then from Fujitsu, we have the FM8, the FM7, the FM77, the FM16, the FM Towns, the FMV Towns, and, and, and so on. And I'll talk about the FM Towns briefly. From Sharp, we had uh, the MZ1500 and 2500 in addition to the ones released in the West. These were much higher end computers, especially the 2500 was a very nice system that we never got. And, and of course the X1 and the X68000, which I will be covering. And like I said, this is the result of some hobbyist research. It's not an official canon of how things went, but, but I, I'll present to you four fascinating systems and, and show you some uh, of, of their games on, on video and, and talk about them. Starting off with the PC-88 or the NEC PC-8801. Uh, released in 1981, it had a uh, Z80 compatible CPU at 4 megahertz, 64 kilobytes of, of RAM, and, and then it came in three different versions. This was the V1 version, where they had a resolution of, of uh, 640 by 200 with eight fixed colors, or 640 by 400 with two colors, and just B per sound. You'll notice that the resolution is, is kind of high compared to, for example, what we had, the, the Commodore 64 multicolor mode, I think it's 160 by 200 or something like that. The reason is that, that these computers were made to display the, uh, the Japanese alphabet the hiragana, katakana, and kanji. And, and these characters cannot really be displayed at very low resolution. And this is uh, part of the reason why uh, these computers developed in the direction they did. They started off with high resolution graphics uh, for a specific need, and, and that's why it became sort of its own ecosystem. And uh, so this was the uh, uh, initial release of the 8801, but it was not the initial 
computer from NEC. They had the PC 6000 and, and so on, even, even further back. But this was made for the home computer hobbyist enthusiast. They steadily upgraded the system. Uh, uh, there were countless different uh, models, but I'll, I've, ju I've just picked two that were sort of remarkable. In 1985, they released the 8801 Mark II SR, and it came with V2 graphics, which means that it now could display eight colors out of a palette of 512, which made the, the color choices much nicer. And, and then there was a new high resolution mode also with 512 possible colors. And it added the Yamaha uh, YN2203 OPM FM sound uh, chip, just a mono sound, but anyway, an FM sound chip. And, and this was purely um, an upgrade to uh, improve games and, and multimedia, if you will because they had noticed that competitors were coming out with other products and they wanted to remain competitive, so they decided to upgrade the, the system. Uh, there was another, another update in 1988 called the PC88VA2, and it upgraded the CPU to 8 megahertz, and, and uh, it had 512 kilobytes of RAM, and it had V3 graphics with uh, 65,000 and change colors, and, and you could have a very high resolution 256 color mode and also upgraded the sound to FM stereo, added ADPCM. However, uh, this system was not very popular. The PC88 in itself was very popular. It sold a substantial number of, of machines, uh, but uh, the, the VA2 only had very limited software support, so uh, it, it never became a, a major thing so there, there, there are not many gains for it, not a lot of software. The first video I have is from the game Bruce Lee, which some uh, Commodore 64 people at least may, may recognize. And this is in the V1 graphics mode with the fixed palette of eight colors. And, and you can see that, or, or possibly you cannot at the moment, but this is the loading screen and, and it has a resemblance of, of Mr. Lee but then you get to the uh, gameplay itself and, and, and you see that it's nothing uh, really special. Maybe I'll, I'll fast forward a bit. You can see here the, the action is, is similar to, to the other 8-bit systems and, and even the, the colors look nice, but you see this sort of uh, pattern in the, in the graphics so they are spaced quite far between the, the, the lines. And uh, this was also used to add more sense of color by means of, of dithering. And uh, actually it used to some very nice effect. But anyway, the V1 games are rarer because it was not thought of as a, as a game system. And, and anyway, games had not really picked up in 1981 yet, so it was, um, not, not very common. Uh, most of the games that, that were released for the PC-88, they run in, in V2 graphics mode. And I have an example that's going to get repeated. The famous space shooter Gradius. And this runs in V2 mode. And also you can see the, the keys over there. Very common that these were controlled via the, the keyboard with, with the number pad, and, and you use Z and X to, to fire. You had A and B. But you could also connect uh, to the, the Mark II SR had a controller port for a two-button joystick or joypad. But you can see that Gradius, it runs nice on, on the system. It, 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 it's not super smooth because the hardware was not really designed for scrolling. It was more for displaying static images. Uh, but uh, what, I, what I will say is that the game is highly playable. It responds to your controls very quickly and, and it's, uh, it might be sluggish on the outside, but, but it plays very well. Also, the FM sound is, is very nice. I didn't want to include it now because it will just mess up the audio, but um, I encourage you to take a listen. It, it sounds very good. And this is from 1986, so slightly later game, but after the release of the Mark II SR. 
And this was the lower end uh, high volume computer in, in, in Japan at that time. Another example of V2 graphics and, uh, and also a common game, Makaimura or Ghosts and Goblins, which uh, again, C64 people may be familiar with. And here you can see also on, on the sides, you can see the, the line pattern. Uh, when I first saw this, I thought it was some sort of problem with my screen, but found out later that it's really supposed to be like that. There's a small space between the, uh, between the lines uh, in, in graphics mode. But uh, the game is exactly as unforgivingly hard on this system as it is on, on everything else. But uh, runs nice, sounds okay. It's playable, but uh, coming from the C64, for example, you can immediately see that this is not a very multimedia oriented system, but, but rather the game uh, features, they were added as an, as an afterthought. But it didn't hurt sales in any way. This, this was a, a popular system. And these can still be had for reasonable money when you look at Yahoo Japan or Mercari or, or the, the local sites. Uh, they're not very expensive because they were very common. But the problem is that there are, there are so many different versions, you need to know exactly what you are buying. I listed three, but there are at least a dozen different ones, and they all have some sort of minute difference, and that, of course, uh, relates to software compatibility and so on. So let's talk about the competition. And again, the, there's a notable omission. That, that I'm making. I'm not going to talk about the Fujitsu FM7 and 77 because I don't have a system and I like to talk about something I've experienced for first hand. But there was the, the Fujitsu systems and there was the, the, the Sharp Ekuzu one. And uh, it was initially released in 1982. Uh, came with a Z80, 4 megahertz, 64 kilobytes of RAM, uh, th uh, 320 by 200 or 640 by 200, eight colors. PCG stands for Programmable Character Generator. And, and this relates to the way how Sharp handled graphics. So instead of having sprites or drawing sprites on the screen or having high screen graphics, you could redefine the character set. And, and you use that to produce your, your graphics. And uh, actually the M MZ700, 721 and, and so on that we had in, even in Finland, it use, also used a, a character generator, but uh, it, it couldn't be reprogrammed. Instead, they had a, a massive number of different characters in the, in the ROM for, for example, racing games or whatnot, but the X1 had the more advanced system, which was also repeated in the 800 series of, of Sharp computers, where you could reprogram the character generator and then use that. Now, some of you might be asking, why did Sharp build two lines of computers? The, 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 the answer is that Sharp was a big company, it still is, and they had two different product lines. They had the computer, the electronics line, and they had the television products line. And the X1 was the first Terebi Pasokon, so personal computer for television. And it uh, linked up with the TV system and, and you could use the monitor to watch TV and you could overlay effects on it and, and so on. So it, it was sort of a parallel product line. And although the systems uh, in terms of hardware, they are strikingly similar, there's no binary compatibility. So you cannot run X1 software on the MZ and vice versa, at least well, barring some, some minor exceptions. But anyway, uh, the software does not run. However, the design philosophy in both was very similar. Sharp used this very clean design where uh, the system would only boot to a very minimal ROM and then you would have to load whatever you liked after that. So there was no basic, no, no DOS, no CPM. Uh, whereas, for example, the PC88 uh, booted into, into basic. Uh, this booted into asking you to enter some sort of software. And you can see that it came with a, with a tape drive and the tape drive in the X1 was fully logic controlled. So it would automatically start running software from tape if you had a tape, tape in it. 
and very beautiful machine. As you can see, it comes in this striking red. Unfortunately, my red X1 does not work yet. It has a faulty power supply and, and the, the belts on the tape drive are broken. But I have an X1 Turbo, which came in 1984 and it added a new graphics mode, 640 by 400, called the higher resolution mode. It wasn't extensively used for games, but it could be used for application software. Then in 1986 came the X1 Turbo Z, and it had all the features of the X1 Turbo, which also had uh, dual disk drives, but it added the uh, Yamaha OPM FM sound chip. So Yamaha was it was doing all right for itself because it was selling these sound chips to everyone. They all upgraded to FM sound and they all used Yamaha chips. And, uh, but the, the hardware otherwise was the same. Uh, the, the CPU speed didn't change and it stayed more or less the, that way throughout. And then in 1987, the X1 Twin, probably the most desirable version, which uh, combined the Turbo Z with the NEC PC engine, which is completely bizarre if you think about it. NEC had their own line of, of home computers and they had the, the game console that was named after them, the PC engine, but now they were willing to license it to Sharp to sell with their X1 computer. One reason could be that they were not really afraid of Sharp because the X1 wasn't a success. The, the NEC PC88 more or less dominated the 8-bit computer market. Of course, there's the MSX that, that we need to talk about, but, uh, uh, but uh, aside from that, it was the most popular sy system. And, and the PC88 was notable, for example, uh, for getting Hideo Kojima started, for getting Enix, Squaresoft, and all the legendary companies they started off releasing for the PC88. And also one of the companies that released for the PC-88 and the X1 was Nintendo. They provided ports of uh, Balloon Fight uh, and even Super Mario Brothers for the X1, but the X1 version of Super Mario Brothers does not feature scrolling. And uh, as you can imagine, it's not great if the screen doesn't scroll, but it's, it's playable, more or less. But uh, like, Back in the day, this wasn't a thing. They didn't think much about it because they thought it was a different market. And this is also one of the features of the Japanese home computer market because the, uh, the game systems were already there, the Famicom, the, the Sega systems, and so on. And they were not thought to be in direct competition. The, the computers were sold to a different market. Whereas in the Western world, uh, you could just dump your Atari 2600 and buy a C64. Uh, in Japan, you'd probably be looking for another type of experience if you bought a, a Pasacon instead of a, um, a game console. And, and these were expensive systems compared to the game consoles and, and it showed in a lot of things. These were high spec things because you can imagine that in 1986, you had a system with dual floppy drives, FM sound, all, all the things and, and we were just loading games off cassette here in, in, in Finland. So this was, these were impressive systems, nevertheless, although they were not that successful. And uh, I have videos. Uh, and this is uh, the, the port of, of Xevious from 1984, uh, the year when the X1 Turbo came out. And uh, as you can see, this system is, is not a fan of scrolling either, but it does it better than the PC-88. This is clearly a system designed with games in mind, whereas on the, on the PC-88, they were sort of an afterthought. And uh, the game, again, I need to uh, commend all of the ports on these systems for their very high playability. Even if it might look sluggish, you don't feel it when you're, when you're playing it. And it plays really well and looks authentic, uh, arcade, not arcade perfect, but, but arcade faithful, you can say. And one of the reasons that's the case is that you can see the text program arranged by Dempa. Dempa, Microsoft, they were a legendary developer that, that came up with a lot of great arcade ports. They knew what they were doing regardless of the, of the system. And this port of, of Galaga from 1981 is also by them, and uh, when you sort of compare and contrast this to the PC-88, you see that, that 
this system has a bit of an edge in terms of, of technological prowess. The, the graphics look, look neater, there, there's, there are no lines, there's no need for dithering. It seems that the colors are, are, are crisp and, and again, uh, once you put in the FM sound, which not all games support, but some do, uh, you get a very uh, nice experience with, with, your, with your gaming. Uh, the, the X1, it's not as, as common as, as the PC-88, but it can still be found if you look on, on Yahoo auctions and, and, and so forth. And you can expect to pay for around 100 euros, 150 for a working system. But many of them have, have some sort of problems. They, of course, the, the belts on the tape drive, they go bad, they, they snap. Uh, the, the power supplies may fail, these sorts of common issues. But um, when you take it apart, you can see that it's very well built. It's, it's like very well designed. And there's even, a, uh, even an expansion bus. So for example, if you have the X1 Turbo, you can put in an FM soundboard and make it equal to the X1 Turbo Z. Of course, then you need a mixer. The, the Turbo Z came with a hardware mixer to mix the, the PSG sound with the FM sound. And, uh, and again, the PSG itself is not a bad sound chip, but, but FM was the way to go in, in Japan in the late 80s. And the, the, uh, some of the music is, is very nice. And like I said, let, let's let Gradius be the benchmark, and this is the X1 port of Gradius from 1986. And uh, it looks slightly better than on the PC-88, but again, uh, gameplay is, is identical, it plays very much the same, and uh, both are enjoyable, but uh, I like the graphics in this one, but then the sound on the, on the PC-88 is better, because uh, this does not yet have FM sound, whereas, whereas the PC-88 had that a standard, it never had a PSG sound chip. But, uh, and it's also notable that these systems all have two button joysticks. It's um, uh, useful in, in games like these. No, no reaching for the space bar like we did on the old Commodore. But uh, here you can see the use of color in this game. It's slightly improved over the uh, PC-88 version. Overall, it's, it's uh, nice. So you had better games, but you had much l fewer games because uh, most of the software came out on the 88. Some came out on all three the Fujitsu FM7, the X1, and the PC-88, but most came out on the PC-88 alone. So this was the status quo in, in 1986. But then in 1987, Sharp decided to do the most over-engineered thing. Um, I'm not sure what motivated the uh, decision, but they wanted to build a system that could compete on specifications with anything that was out there, including the Commodore Amiga, just, as much as I love that system. Uh, this was a crazy beast. It came out in 1987 with a 10 megahertz uh, Motorola 68000 processor, a megabyte of RAM, which could be expanded up to eight on the, on the standard system, actually 10. But then the graphics modes, you had resolutions up to 20, 1024 by 1024, between 16 and 65,000 colors. You had hardware scrolling, 128 sprites with superimposed bitmap planes on top of each other. You had an eight channel FM sound, for, again from Yamaha. You had a stereo a digital to analog converter. You had a, a, a separate OK chip for ADPCM sound. You had a SCSI controller, or, or on the earlier versions, it was a SASI controller. It was everything. And it used three different uh, refresh rates. You could run it as 15 kilohertz, 24, and, and 31 kilohertz, which of course made the uh, screens very costly. But the system itself was also very expensive. Uh, at the time, it was the, pr the price of two and, and, and change Amiga 500s, and you could get like a dozen Sega Mega Drives for the for the price. 
So this was an exclusive system designed for the enthusiasts. But we also need to take into account that the standard of living in Japan was extremely high in the late 80s. And those who wanted in on this hobby, they had the means and they had the, the, the will to, to pay for a very good system. And this is what, what they got. It received two updates. Again, there, were, there are like these minor revisions along the way, but in 1991, the X68016, which runs at 16 megahertz, came out. Then there was a version called the Red Zone, which went even a bit higher. And then in 1993, the final version came out, the X68030, which had a, the, the Motorola 68030 at 25 megahertz. And uh, you can also uh, upgrade the, the system. Uh, turbo cards came out for this system, much like for the Amiga. You can go up to an 060, even though it's not really helping you in terms of, of compatibility, but, uh, but you can do that. Uh, most games, however, were designed for the 10 megahertz 68,000. So if you're just into games, that's the, the system to, to go to. And uh, here we see the two models side by side, the, the 68,000 Expert on the right and the 68030 on the, on the left. And this was not the initial model. The, the first one, it was gray, but the black one then, then came out a bit later. And we had the Pro version, which had a horizontal case, actually more expansion slots. You could put four in those, uh, whereas you had only two expansion slots on the, on the standard system as if you wanted to expand, but yeah, you could put in a SCSI card, you could put in a MIDI card, you could put in extra RAM and, and what have you. Starting off with, with Gradius from 1987, and you can see sort of the, the, the leap ahead in terms of uh, how much this looks like the arcade game. A lot of the ports for the X68000, they were designed to look very much like the arcade, up to the point where they ask you to insert coin. Uh, this, of course, was meant to give you the uh, sort of the idea that they were the actual arcade versions. Mostly they were not, uh, they were ports, but they were very good ports. And for example, Capcom, they used the X68000 as the basis for their CPS arcade hardware. Uh, so they, they looked at the 68K and said, okay, it has to be at least good as, as good as this. And so that's why it became the development tool for them. And, and if you think about what we got around the same time in the West, this is a, in, a, in a league of its own in many respects. And, and the, the sound is also very, very, very nice. And if that's not enough for you, then a lot of the games have MIDI support and you can just play your Roland MT32 or SC55 in the background for even uh, nicer audio. Super Hang On, just an, as an example of a Sega super scalar game. So in the um, sort of vein of Outrun, Space Harrier and so on, there was no port of Outrun, but there was a port of uh, Super Hang On and that gives you an idea of what Outrun might have looked like on this system. And it would have looked like this, which I, I find to be very nice, even though I suck at this game. But uh, you can see that there's no None of the typical things you would see in the Western conversions, the blinking road, the uh, pop-up graphics and so on, it looks very much like the arcade game and plays very much like it as well. And uh, this, was, this was the norm in a, in a lot of ways. And uh, the next one is also, yeah, this is not an arcade game. This is a port. Uh, 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 sorry, not a port, but it's, a, it's an original development by Famibe no Yoshin. And uh, it's a hobbyist game uh, from 1995, so very late in the system's life, uh, called Choren Sha. The capture is not perfect because it runs in 
in 31 kilohertz, so it got a bit squished. But uh, you'll see what I'm getting at, nevertheless. It's a very quick shooter game, very responsive, runs very, very beautifully. And uh, this is why the, the X68000, it's such a cult system in the West even, it was one of the first ones to gain this sort of recognition and uh, it's still a very popular system for, for hobbyists. And uh, the prices re reflect that. These are quite expensive systems to, to acquire. If you have a working uh, X68K, you can expect to pay uh, seven, 800 euros for, for a system. If it's an O30, one of the higher end ones, well past a thousand euros for, for a good one. But the, you get an invitation to this exclusive club of people who get to play these beautiful arcade. Arcade perfect, almost arcade perfect ports that were unheard of in our hemisphere at that time. And uh, it's, a, it's a really impressive, nice, well thought out system. Uh, except for one thing, the, the OS is not great. It runs a system called Human 68K, Human OS, and it's like a CPM MS-DOS relative for the, the 68000. And also there's a window uh, system, a graphical user interface known as the SX window. And uh, uh, neither of those are really needed much because the games are usually made to boot from, from floppy or if you put in a hard drive, you can just use a, a hobbyist hard drive image that has a lot of games installed. You don't need to use those for anything. But if you do, it, it's like a, a slightly poorer version of, of DOS. And I think it would have benefited from a, a better OS in, in that respect. But, but what I think really kept it out of the Western market was the, the price. It had so many features that were really needed to, to do this arcade game stuff and also for the Japanese characters and, and so on. And, and it would have been fairly prohibitive to, to uh, try to sell them over here, especially at, at that time. But uh, they were not the most popular systems in, in Japan. We'll get to what was, but uh, it was, uh, there was a market. It, it sold and, and the people who loved it, they were very much like the, the, the fans of the Amiga who also loved their system a lot and, and continue tweaking it to, to this day. Another crazy great system from around the same time, the Fujitsu FM Towns. So Fujitsu had the FM7, the FM77, and then some business uh, machines that ran CPM, MS-DOS, and so on. But uh, NEC was on that market very much with the PC98, and they were having a hard time competing with them. So they, they also decided to go all out and, and build a, a really crazy system. And in 1989, they came out with the FM Towns. And, and the, the towns in the name, it's not about the towns as in cities, but it's about the Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Towns, which actually is spelled with an E, but they wanted to leave that out because then they were feared that the name would get pronounced townies or, or whatnot. Con confusing, convoluted, but anyway. So the first one uh, came out in... 1989. It was a Intel-based system, uh, and also they used also AMD chips. But anyway, um, 80, 30, uh, 38, uh, 386SX, 386SX, at 16 megahertz with two megabytes of RAM, expandable again. It also had a lot of graphics modes from uh, 320 by 200 to 720 by uh, 512, up to 32,000 colors from 60 million. So although the um, X68K had more colors, it had a, this had a larger palette, so the end result was indistinguishable. 1,024 sprites, sprite layer, bitmap overlays, all the things. So 
a lot of the overlay stuff was anyway needed to uh, display the, the, the characters correctly, but it could also be used to some great effect in, in games. And it had a massive sound chip, the, the Rico, with eight PCM channels, and again, the Yamaha OPN2, six channel FM sound. Uh, also, very notable thing, it was the first computer in the world to have a CD-ROM drive as standard and to be able to boot from that. And how they managed that was impressive. What they did was they, they had a minimal MS-DOS in ROM, and all that would do was uh, boot up, then load MS-CD extensions, and uh, then boot from, from CD. And most games will boot directly from the CD. Some require a floppy in addition to the CD in order, in order to boot. But the notable thing is that most FM Town systems had no hard drive. Because you would think uh, that, that if the system is otherwise this is impressive, of course it will have a massive hard drive as well. Uh, and, and of course they had SCSI controllers. But a lot of the systems that you find secondhand, they don't have hard drives because it's really not needed if you're just mostly using ready-made software, not even games alone. If you can save your work on floppy disks, then you don't need the, uh, the hard drive for anything. In 1993, they decided to capitalize on the uh, potential for games, and they consoleized the system, created the FM Towns Marty, and it's basically the first system just in a very compact format with a CD drive, floppy drive, and, and SV VHS output. And then in 1995, they had the FMV towns, and this was the end of the line for the system. So it was a standard PC, but it came with an expansion card that contained the original FM towns hardware. So you could switch it over to FM towns mode, and then it would run off the, the card. So basically, it was just not, not an emulator, it was a full hardware implementation of the original towns, and, and it was a Pentium system. Uh, between these models, they, they introduced a lot of different ones. There were FM towns, pure FM towns models based on the 486, and some even on the Pentium. But how they did that was they used a 486 motherboard, and then they used a Pentium overdrive CPU to upgrade it to Pentium. And of course, this like incurs a performance hit, but uh, it didn't matter that much because most of the FM Towns' software was anyway written for the 386 and the SX. So it, it wasn't that big of a deal. But uh, despite the number of models, despite the developments, this also was not a hugely popular system. Again, there were sales and there was a lot of hype about this, even, even in the West, but it never made its breakthrough. Again, the reason quite probably was that it was very expensive. I think it was even more than the X68K. But it looks so beautiful. This is the uh, Model 2F. It looks identical to the first model, save for some differences on the front uh, panel. And uh, it came with its own display because it also uses the tri-sync system. It has different refresh rates. And uh, the CD-ROM, because they wanted to emphasize that this is the first system with a CD-ROM, they put it front and center. And they made huge efforts to make it as cheap, of course, as possible, which has sort of backfired later on, because as the, these get old, the, the drive motors wear, wear down, and they no longer spin the disk properly. It's, it's quite heavy to spin the disk when it's upright like that. And usually uh, some brands of CDR do not work properly. You, you need lighter ones. And uh, these sorts of problems appear later on when an FM town system gets old. But uh, when new, it's, it looked astonishing. And it's also a royal pain to take apart because you have to unscrew just one little screw, then the whole thing comes apart like a jigsaw puzzle, but it's a very difficult puzzle. I don't recommend it for first timers. But uh, when it works and, and it's presented like that, it looks gorgeous. And I have games for you. The New Zealand Story, 1989 from Bing, which was one of the better 
uh, porters of arcade things. And uh, those familiar with the New Zealand story can surely appreciate that this is more or less just like the original arcade game. I'm not saying it's arcade perfect. I don't have expert player knowledge, but it's very impressive. And the fun thing about the FM Towns is that you can, of course, have even the very original arcade soundtrack because you can play audio off CD. Fujitsu made a big point about this. And in many games like Marble Madness, for example, which was an Atari system, one game from, from uh, I think 1984 or something like that, they not only made an arcade perfect looking conversion, they had all the sound soundtrack, the entire soundtrack re-recorded uh, in, in Redbook audio by an, like, a, like an orchestral arrangement. And they did this a lot. And uh, it gives you a great, great audio track. Of course, you're, if you're not into that thing, you want the original one, it will just bother you. But, but if you like it, then, then it's beautiful. The New Zealand story has the original arcade sound. The second one, and, and another game I suck at, is, uh, is Afterburner, which we also have here at the Finnish Museum of Games. Um, and this is also something that looked mightily impressive in 1989, because the, the number of stuff the amount of stuff, the volume of stuff on the screen is very impressive. The planes just keep coming, the, the landscape just keeps coming, everything scales like crazy towards you. And, and uh, this is one game where the home computer versions in the West failed because they couldn't reproduce the, the feeling of speed, the, the, the massive uh, thing that, that, that was the main point about the, the entire game. And uh, this, this could very comfortably do that with all of its sprite trickery and, and zooming and scaling and so on. But uh, we, of course, need to contrast and compare. I think the X68000, in a way, it was even more powerful in terms of pure graphics manipulation. But if you add the CD capabilities of the FM Towns and the fact that it has slightly more processing power, it made it a bit more of a, of a robust system. And uh, again, FM Towns doesn't have Outrun, it has Turbo Outrun, but Chase Headquarters is a, is a nice racing game that shows you what, what the system can do. And uh, it's not arcade perfect in terms of gameplay. The, uh, the intersections are different and, and there are, it's much easier. But uh, as you can see, this is a far cry from the home computer versions in the, in the West and also features the, the full soundtrack and so on. And uh, I'll get to that later, but the reason I'm showing you arcade games, of course, is that I don't speak Japanese very well. Uh, a lot of the games that are sort of the strategy, strategy games, the, the adventure games and so on, you need uh, expert understanding of Japanese to be able to really enjoy them. But uh, FM Towns, as it was almost a PC, received ports from the Western IBM PC games. So you have uh, stunts, 4D driving, uh, you have uh, life and death, uh, Dungeon Master, things like this, because uh, it was close enough to, to where the, the porting effort wasn't like, uh, it wasn't too massive. Uh, the FM Towns, it ran uh, two different types of OS. Um, it had, of course, the minimal MS-DOS. It could run a special version of, of Microsoft Windows. And the later models, they could, of course, run straight Windows. Then you could run other stuff in the FM Towns mode. But then they had a, a separate graphical user interface known as the Towns OS, which had a file manager and could launch software. And that was the default experience. But these were sort of bordering on the DOS thing. They were not DOS compatible, but many of them ran a sort of compatible version. You couldn't run the same binaries, but you could do a lot of the same operations. And of course, you could leverage the, the file systems and, and so on from the, from the others. But uh, again, the FM Towns, it wasn't a resounding success. Now, it was costly, of course. 
but uh, I think, of course, being from a single ven vendor, no matter how good it was, it, it was difficult to compete uh, with, with MS-DOS and in Japan, especially with the NEC PC-98, which we'll get to, to next, because that was the, the system to own. The reasons for that are, are, are various, but uh, I think both Sharp and uh, Fujitsu, they had to compete by choosing an angle that NEC wasn't using, uh, uh, whereas they, they tried to uh, sell to the enthusiasts. And that, of course, it's never going to be as big of a market as the, the sort of the common standard user market. But uh, you can find FM town systems in the wild still. Uh, the, the, the tower models, when you look up Yahoo, Yahoo Japan, I mean, they, they come up like every now and then. Uh, and, and the prices range from, let's say, 50 euros for, for a somewhat broken system to two, 300 for a working one. And the town's Marty is the most expensive one, surprisingly, uh, except for the FMV towns, which is very rare and, and, and desirable. But uh, the town's Marty is desirable because it's a very compact system and it allows you to enjoy most of the games. Also because there's an uh, optical drive emulator available for that called the Doc Brown. So it's a very nice modding project as well. But you can expect to pay about a thousand euros for, for a town's Marty and similar money or more for an FMV towns. But uh, if you really want to just play the games, I recommend you go for the tower model and sort out the problems. And then you have a system that didn't cost an arm and, arm and a leg. And you can play most of the games on that as well. And again, many different variants, different CPUs. There's a desktop model, uh, then uh, uh, these other tower models with, with uh, 386, the SX, and I think there's a, and you can swap that over to a 486 and so on, but most of the games are designed for a fairly low spec original models. And we'll finish off with what everyone else was competing against, the NEC PC-98. And uh, NEC had the sort of a two-prong strategy wherein they wanted to sell the PC-88 to the home computer hobbyists and then the PC-98 to businesses. And as time moved on, these lines became sort of converged and uh, the PC-98 started selling to homes. They decided to start upgrading it with sound and, and better graphics and, and so on. And it started attracting the game developers simply because of the sheer number of units that were out there. Again, there are so many models of the PC-98 that I've only collected some of them here. But in 1982, so only a year after the PC-88, we had the 89, uh, 9801 with the 80.86 at 5 megahertz, 128 28 kilobytes of RAM, and uh, 640 by 408 colors, again for the special characters. In uh, 85, you had the VF, which had the graphic charger improve the selection of colors and also upgraded the CPU to 8 megahertz. Then the UV in 86 added the FM sound, the VX upgraded to 80, 286, 10 megahertz with the enhanced graphic charger at 16 colors. And between these, there were dozens of models. There's so many PC-98, it's, it's absolutely crazy. In 1992, you had the 9821 with uh, 386SX, three and change megabytes of RAM, and a CD-ROM as standard. But by that time, the FM Towns had been out for three years already. Then just to proceed along, uh, in 1997, we were up to Pentium MMX, and then we had a DVD decoder, TV tuner, CD-ROM, all the things. And the final system was a Celeron 433 in the year 2000. And like I said, dozens of different SK SKUs between this. And also two clone manufacturers, Seiko Epson, they made clones of the 9801. And ASD Research, they made a hybrid system, which was IBM PC compatible and PC-98 compatible. And uh, here's Magical Block Karat. As an example of a PC-98 game, 
typical in a lot of ways. It's not scrolling oriented. The system doesn't do it very well. So just static screens, please. And then it also features nice anime, manga, graphics. This is because of the intersection of the cultures of anime, manga enthusiasts and, and also the computer enthusiasts. And that would be a topic for another presentation. So I won't go that much further into that. But as you can see, nice graphics above EGA standards and very nice use of dithering to create a, a very nice picture. And uh, some of the motivation for playing this game comes from seeing the, the pretty pictures of the, of the girls later on. But these sorts of puzzle games were very popular. And as I mentioned, there were also ports from uh, IBM PC to the PC-98 due to reasons of hardware similarity. The PC-98 was not hardware compatible in any way. The expansion bus was different. Uh, the, the arrangement of the CPU and RAM and so, so on, they were, they were different, but they were just similar enough so that you could do some, some porting. And in my experience, this is recorded from the uh, RX model, 286 at 12 megahertz, and it runs a bit better than my uh, old PC IBM compatible at the same clock speed. Let's continue. Sorry about that. But if this is the least of our troubles, then, then we're home free. So exhausting to, to try to get this running. But yes, yeah, Steam Hearts, AeroJ, shoot them up. And here's another one featuring girls. Ningyo Tsukai on Metal and Lace 2. This is a fighting game where you are then rewarded with imagery of your opponent in various states of undress. Again, the, the combination of the male culture in Japan at that time, the game culture and so on. That's a topic of discussion, but I won't go into that. I'm just interested in the hardware. As you can see, it, the game sort of runs. It's not beautiful, but, it, but it's playable. And, and that was enough for, for most people. And then this is one of the rare examples that were ported into the West. Thexter was another notable one, but uh, this was uh, ported to the West as Metal and Lace 2, fairly rare game. Final slide, we made it. But uh, yeah, the, the PC-98, it was a massive success. It sold millions of, of, of units. And if you want a PC-98, it's not hard to get one. But again, you need to know what you're buying because the, the versions are very uh, different and they are very many. So if you want to play games, uh, probably you need a, an early system for the early games and then a later system for the late stuff. Because uh, as in a, an IBM PC, uh, a 486 or Pentium will not run the 8086 stuff very nice and, and, and vice versa. So it might be good to get two systems. It's not uh, expensive in terms of the original purchase because these can be had for 50 euros, 100 euros. If, you, if it's had like some bad caps or whatnot, then, then you can get it for next to nothing. But of course, the, the cost of shipping will be substantial. These are heavy units. And you need a display that can display 24 kilohertz. But some of the multi-sync monitors, even the TFTs, can do that. So that's not a massive problem. But then uh, I need to talk about how I suck and why I shouldn't be trusted. Uh, this is a very Western view on the Japanese computer scene. And, and the first thing to note is the language barrier. Uh, I don't speak Japanese very much. I, I don't read much Japanese, just the hiragana katakana. And, uh, and that limits, of course, my understanding of what's going on. Uh, the Google Translate app, it's wonderful. You can take pic pictures of the screen and then translate and try to understand what the machine's trying to tell you. But uh, anyway, that leaves out a lot of games. Like there are great strategy games from the PC-98, from Koei software, for example, and also for the 88, and also for the, for the 68K FM Towns, you have these adventure games. And, and RPGs and such that you really cannot play unless you find a fan translation or then you just move very slowly or use a walkthrough. 
So that's why my research has been focused on these action games. Also, there is something of an established canon for these systems, uh, that what are the good games and such. But there were thousands of so-called Dojin releases for the PC-98. Uh, these hobbies, things that uh, came out in small numbers, were distributed on discs. And uh, it's very time consuming to sort those out and, and to find the gems there. So I've been mainly playing this canon of the best PC-98, best PC-88 and so on. But uh, coming to my original idea of why I'm doing this is that this is a fascinating rabbit hole. Even if you're not into manga, anime, all the soft porn stuff, uh, there are great games to be had, to be found, and, and to be enjoyed, and, and stuff that you've never heard of, and it's so fascinating to find an entire ecosystem of hardware that we were kept in the dark about because it was not relevant. They were not offered for sale here. They were not meant for us in the, in the West because they serve the special purpose of being able to display the speci special characters and the hardware was sort of built a around that. But yeah, this was my short presentation. If you feel like discussing th this issue further, I, I, I encourage you to uh, reach out. I'm happy to talk about it. And like I mentioned in the Japanese computer enthusiast groups, I'm sure that I've made a lot of mistakes and, and factual inaccuracies and I'm sorry about that. But uh, I hope this serves as some sort of introduction to this fascinating world. And we lived. Thank you.